Bruchem Aboyen. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. Um, last week we ended up with a uh, my thought on mask. Again, we only got partway through. So this week I'd like to continue with the uh, <laughs> thing that we do all the time, mass. Uh, it's amazing. I say hello to people and I give mazel tov to people I don't even recognize anymore. It's kind of funny. Anyways, let's uh, see what we have to say about more about mass. From the creation of the world until today, the greatest sin that one can commit, in fact, many com commentaries say, even more grievous than the three cardinal sins that one must give up their life for, which is idol worship, sexual impropriety, and murder. The sin is lush and hard, tail bearing. Yes, it began with the snake in the Garden of Eden, and it continues nonstop until today. Like everything else we have today, quicker, better, and more efficient, and with the advent of computers, social media, and cell phones. Divine punishment and reward generally are reserved for the world to come. However, God sees this trait, this sin of Lush and Hara, as so grievous that he wrote into his Torah that the punishment for this sin would be administered here on earth. Its importance and influence on our lives can be attested to the fact that Lush and Hara is found written in each of the five books of the Torah. In the first book, Genesis, first man, Adam, was expelled from the Garden of Eden because of the Lush and Hara of the snake. Yosef, was sold into slavery into Egypt by his brothers because of the lush and hurry spoke about them. In the second book of the Torah, Exodus, Moshe has to run for his life in Egypt because of the lush and hurry said about him by Dustin and Aviron after he has killed the Egyptian. Moshe was also stricken with leprosy by God Almighty when he spoke lush and hurry about the people. He expressed his doubts concerning their acceptance of his mission. He felt that the people would not believe that he had been sent by God to redeem them from their oppressive slavery. In the third book of the Torah, in Leviticus, it tells us about the laws of leprosy. We are told the one who speaks Lush and Hara may be afflicted with this infection. His punishment may appear as a discoloration on his house, clothing, or on his body. All this is done by God in the hope that the leper will realize the error of his ways and do tshuva, that he should repent. A true sign of a benevolent father, one who is willing to administer tough love now in the hope of saving his beloved child and much greater retribution later. In the fourth book of the Torah, in the book of Numbers, it relates the story of the spies. Because of the lush and heart that the spies spoke about the land of Israel, the nation was sentenced to wander in the desert for 40 years. We also read in this book about the rebellion of Korach and his group. They spoke Lushner about Moshe. They paid heavily for their abuse of the gift of speech. Finally, in the last book of the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, we read about one of the six remembrances that we are said to remember, say, every day. We remember, as it says, that we remember what God did to Miriam on the road, is the quote. When she spoke Lushner about her brother Moshe after she heard that he had separated from his wife, Tzipporah. In reality, the story about Miriam speaking Lush and Hara about Moshe was found in the fourth book of the Torah, at the end of the portion of Baal Losecha. The question we have to ask is why is it mentioned again as an allusion, stating what God did to Miriam in the fifth book? There's no mention of Lush and Hara, so why is it mentioned daily as one of the six remembrances? So to understand the story properly, we first have to go back to the Jews in Egypt. Paro decreed that all male babies were to be thrown into the Nile. Amram, Moshe's father, who was the leader of the generation when he saw what the Egyptians were doing to their newborn sons, he just divorced his wife, Zipporah. Seeing his action, many other men divorced their wives. Interestingly enough, it was the young Miriam who got her father to remarry his wife, by saying to him that he was worse than Paro. She said to him, Paro was only killing the males. You are destroying the whole nation. So he then remarried Yochebet, his wife, and others followed him. Now before the giving of the Torah to the nation at Mount Sinai, God told Moshe to tell the people to separate from their wives for two days so that they would be in a state of physical purity 
when they would be receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. After they received the Torah, Moshe realizing that he was constantly in communication with God, then separated from his wife so that he would always be physically ready to receive God's presence. So when Miriam became aware that her brother had separated from his wife, she spoke to her brother Aaron about Moshe's action, which she felt was selfish and insensitive towards his wife. She also saw it as a personal affront, since they too were prophets. Yet they continued to live normal, marital lives. Why wouldn't he? She had failed to realize just how elevated her younger brother Moshe had become. God saw her words as an affront to Moshe and his position. As the verse reads in Baalosra 12.8, How can you not be afraid to speak against my servant, Moshe? Until, up until this incident, Moshe's greatest supporters were the righteous women of that generation. It was they who seduced their husbands in the fields in Egypt, even though Paro was killing their children. They did not complain. They looked forward to entering the land that was promised to our forefathers. Now the men of that generation, ages 12 to 60, all died in the desert. But all the women entered, that is, unless they died of old age, much like Miriam, who died in the desert at the age of 126. If not for Miriam's sin of Lush and Hara, the whole incident of the spies may well never have occurred, which would have meant that the Jews would have entered the land of Israel in the beginning of the second year in the wilderness. Instead, they were sentenced to wander in the desert for 40 years. But how? Well, when the women heard about Miriam's lush and heart that Moshe had separated from his wife, they were afraid that their husbands, just like with the story of Amram, would separate from them, divorce them. So when the men told Moshe that they wanted to send spies to reconnoiter the land, the women were silent. Now, normally, they would have told their husbands, if Moshe says it's good, then that's more than good enough. We don't need spies. Well, the rest is history. Other than the sin of idol worship, there is no other sin that is mentioned in each of the five books of the Torah. The person who speaks Lush and Hara says, what did I do? I didn't strike anyone. I didn't steal anything. All I did was say something. Words. What's the big deal? You know, when I grew up, there was a little saying that was told to children. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, guess what? <laughs> names do hurt. And sometimes very deeply. Words make people cry, make them hide their faces in shame, blush, get angry. All types of negative and hurtful emotions created with no physical contact at all. The person who becomes afflicted with leprosy is designated as a leper by the word of the coin, by the priest. He says, Tame, unclean. Only a Kohen, God's representative of earth, can pronounce someone a leper. And then again, when the leper is cured, only a Kohen can pronounce him Tahar, pure. It all goes back to a word, the power of the tongue. You know, they tell a story by the commentaries about Tuvi, who was a servant of Reb Gamliel. Reb Gamliel told Tuvi to go to the marketplace and buy the best thing he could find. Tuvi came back with a tongue. Then Rungam Lil sent him back to the marketplace with instructions to buy the worst thing in the market. Again, Tubi came back with a tongue. As the verse says in Mishle, Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Tailbearing, he said, she said, has brought about many difficulties and tragedies in people's lives. In the secular world, tailbearing may not be classified as a sin, but the consequences certainly smack from painful retribution. I've been in the restaurant business for many years, and I've seen how this trade of tail bearing has caused many internal problems in my delis, not just verbally, but also leading to physical altercations between employees and even their families. For the individual who commits this transgression, they are punished with a disease that is called saras, or leprosy in English. This is not the same as the long-term infection, a physical condition called leprosy. The Torah is referring to a physical manifestation of a spiritual deficiency. The Torah defines leprosy with a physical description such as discoloration of the skin and hair. 
And this is in addition to other factors that are connected with this condition. This physical manifestation of a spiritual leprosy can also affect one's clothing and one's house. We know that this condition is spiritual and not the result of a physical infection. The fact becomes obvious when we learn that the cure for this spiritual affliction is solitary confinement, not a leper colony. The tale bearer has caused rifts in personal relationships between people. He has brought about breakups of friendships, families, and marriages. God wants him to experience the devastation on his, of his actions <clears throat> firsthand. So the leper is sentenced by God to solitary confinement outside the camp. He cannot even communicate with another leper. He must live alone. Not only that, he must call out to all that see him, defiled, defiled. This treatment is not a cure for his infectious physical condition. It is a prescription to cure his spiritual deficiency. His mandatory solitary confinement helps to make him realize just how important and necessary social contact and interaction are. The best way for him to understand the pain that he has caused is by forcing him to live a life in seclusion. He now suffers some of the same feelings of loneliness and despair that he has caused others. All that goes around, comes around. When God created this world, he repeated the word tov, good, again and again. The first time that he used the term low tov, that is not good, was in Genesis 2.18, where it states, God said, it is not good for a man to live alone. Man is a social creature. He was not to live, meant to live a life as a hermit. You know, in prison, one of the forms of punishment that's very effective is solitary confinement. It's very difficult to live by yourself in your own mind. Once the leopard comes to this realization, then, only then, can the healing process begin. And hopefully, he can once again enter in society. Not everything in life that God created was meant to be seen. Sometimes we need to mask our thoughts and feelings, not speaking or showing all the pieces that make up the whole. We see in the Torah that when God creates woman, he first puts Adam, first man, to sleep so that he doesn't witness how Chava was constructed. All he saw was the final product. She was gorgeous. If he had witnessed her being, so to speak, being assembled, all that blood and gore, well, he may not have been able to get that image out of his mind. Instead, all he saw was her beauty. We don't have to tell our spouses about every stupid mistake or misstep that we have made in our lives. We are allowed to mask those feelings that pain us in a negative fashion. Marriage is not a true confessional. If the person that you are with, the person you love, that's the person who you are now, then they have accepted all the experiences, good and bad, that have made you into the person that you are now. Take one incident out of your life and you may not be the same person. Be smart. Don't ever try to force someone to unmask that which they feel is best covered. This is great advice for those who are looking for a mate for a shidduch. Put your best foot forward. Emphasize your positives. You don't have to advertise your negatives. Who knows? You might find a mate. I guess if we look around us today, God finally said, enough, enough is enough. Even if he didn't stop the sin of tail-bearing completely, he sure put a dent in it. Wearing a mask does make it harder to talk to people, no matter what you're talking about. More often than not, when people talk about others, well, they try to do so privately and quietly. Most people don't want others to know that they are tail-bearing. So I think that it's easy enough to understand why tailbearing could be detrimental to society at large on a purely secular level. However, on a spiritual level, based on Kabbalah, it may have even more devastating results than just hurting people's feelings. It can be deadly. Yes, deadly. We believe that Satan, or the devil, wears three hats. He is called the Eight Sahara the evil inclination, that voice that resides within each and every one of us. 
try and convince us to sin, so to speak, our subconscious. He's also referred to as Sutton, Satan, the devil, the accuser, the prosecuting angel, the attorney, who accuses us before the heavenly court. And then, in the end, he is the Malachim of us, the angel of death. He is the grim reaper. So first he entices us into sinning. Then after we succumb to the temptation, he accuses us for committing the sin. And then finally in the end, he is the one who administers the punishment for any and all transgressions we have committed in our lifetime. As an aside, the devil is so evil that not only does he entice us into sinning, but after we sin, you would think he'd let us enjoy it, but no, it is he who makes us feel guilty. There's a saying in Hebrew that says, Do not open your mouth to Satan. What does that exactly mean? We have a belief that Satan is both blind and mute. He can neither see nor can he speak. On the other hand, we do know that he's covered with eyes. So how are we to understand these two contradictory statements? It's true that, this, that the Satan is blind. You see, but when we sin, we act as if no one is looking. And by doing so, we ignore the fact that there is a God in the world that sees everything. So with each sin that we commit, we add another eye to the Sutton. So the Sutton can hear and see our transgressions. You see, but he still has one major problem. He doesn't have a mouth. So he does not have the ability to speak. If he can't speak, he can't accuse us before the heavenly court. So now we can understand why the sin of Lush and Heart is so devastating. When we speak about other people, you see, we give Sutton a mouth. He now has the power to accuse us of our sins and bring us up on charges before the heavenly court. The sin of Lush and Hara, tail bearing, affects three people. The one speaking, the one listening, and the one whom they are speaking about. All three of these individuals are in jeopardy. But why? So I mentioned before, I'm a restaurateur. I own delis. It happened some years ago that I caught one of my cashiers stealing. She had taken an envelope containing $200 and put it in her purse. Now, the whole incident was captured, recorded on video. I took the video to the police department, thinking that they would arrest her and charge her with a crime, steal them. But no. <laughs> they informed me that all the evidence would be entered into her file. They said if she stopped, was stopped for a traffic violation or any other infraction, then they would prosecute her in addition for her theft. So the bottom line was, if she did not have any contact with law enforcement, then her theft would never be dealt with. And so too in heaven. We can sin and sin, and these sins are entered into our file in heaven. But we are not prosecuted. We are not called to the court. One of God's greatest traits is called erech which means long-suffering. God, much like a benevolent father, does not want to punish us. He wants us to repent, to learn, to get better. God wants to destroy the sin, not the sinner. That being the case, Sins that we do are not dealt with immediately. God gives us time and the ability to repent. There's no rush to bring us before the court. After all, he loves us. However, once we speak Lush and Hara, or have Lush and Hara spoken about us, then we need a great defense attorney. The Sutton now has a mouth to accuse us, which will cause our records to be reviewed, now we will be summoned be, to be judged before the heavenly court. So with our mouths, we give the side of evil the power and ability to accuse us for our sins. If only we kept our mouths shut, or at least tried to think before we speak. We could save ourselves a great deal of complications in this world and retribution in the next. In today's society, it seems almost impossible to not get caught up, caught up and talking about other people. Can you imagine the spiritual level that our ancestors must have attained? They were actually able to live their lives without speaking about other people. <laughs> wow. 
If that were not the case, think of it, then most people would have been lepers. Proof is in the pudding. The spirituality of the generations has declined throughout the years. Today, people are not on such an elevated level of tailbearing to be punished with leprosy. If the results of Lush and Heart today <laughs> would be leprosy, we would all be lepers. Think of it. Those few righteous individuals who wouldn't speak Lush and Heart would actually be punished just by looking different. We, the tailbearers, would be the norm, and those who stayed righteous would be the freaks. So God had to find another way to at least slow down our tail bearing. So now, we wear masks. In reality, we should all be lepers. But you think of it that way, maybe, maybe masks aren't so bad, especially if they help us to watch our mouths. Having a covering over our mouths may help us to limit our conversations to those words that don't involve talking about other people or at least help us to think before we speak. In a strange way, this pandemic has made the world just a little more religious and really a little more godly. Let's look at the facts. People are speaking less lush and horror. They are practicing more acts of kindness. They are giving more charity. They are taking more interest in the health and the lives of their elderly parents and relatives. They're praying more, spending more time with their families, and there is less physical contact between the sexes. In addition, with all the world sequestered for so long, <laughs> I'm sure more babies are being born. All of these things are merits that help us to become more godly. Hopefully, the pandemic will end soon. But let's hope. Let's hope that these positive benefits that we have acquired do not. And with that, may we merit to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikana quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you and your families. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, have a Shabbat Shalom. God bless.